As I mentioned uh, before, our offering this morning is for World Renew Maternal and Child Health. And for those of you who are not aware, either here or at, uh, at home, uh, that is a specific part of the ministry that World Renew does, helping people throughout the world, especially, especially in develop, the developing world, um, particularly in terms of, um, of helping mothers um, and pregnant women with their, uh, their health uh, during their pregnancy and afterwards with their children uh, and their health. And uh, you can look for World Renew on the internet and uh, find out more about World Renew and what they do, including this specific program uh, if you do a Google search for World Renew. Also, uh, Mark, and, um, Mark and Bonnie Primo asked that we would have a prayer for uh, Jesse uh, this, this week. Uh, he is facing some uh, medical uh, challenges upcoming. Um, and so just prayer for him as he goes to specialists and various other folks. Uh, and also prayer for Mark and Bonnie and the rest of the family too as they, <coughs> as they go on this journey uh, with him. Now, let us come before God in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for this time together. We ask that you would uh, continue to bless us during this service, that we would glorify you in uh, the, the words that we say, the meditations of our heart, the, the, the sermon, the scripture, all that we hear and take into our spirits and souls and minds. Lord, please help us to grow, to be encouraged, and to be sent forth from this place full of your joy and your strength. Father, we come before you, laying before you this world. Lord, we hear of so many things that are, um, that are worrisome and stressful and Lord, we confess that we worry too about these things. And so, Lord, we lay down our worries before you. And we lay this world before you, too, O oh God. We know, O oh God, that you have promised that you will, in Jesus Christ, return to judge the living and the dead, and that you will make all things new, creating a new heaven and a new earth. And that all things, will be made right. And we know, O oh God, that in the meantime, as we strive to share your good news with this world, there are other forces that strive to rip it apart, to steal, kill, and destroy. Have mercy on this world, O oh God, and please, please guide us that we may be salt and light in this world. That we may, with your spirit, preserve what is good, add flavor to this world, shed light on the wrongs and injustices, and guide those who are seeking truth to you. Lord, we pray for those who are facing additional stress during this time, which is almost everybody. Father, we pray for even the, the, the stress of, of having to make COVID-19 related decisions whether it's okay to do this or okay to do that or whether it's all 
what to do. Lord, we pray that you will be with those who are feeling particularly lonely and isolated. We pray that you will be with students and teachers and other staff workers and professors and uh, university and college students. Lord, we pray that you will be with them as they navigate the waters of school during a pandemic. Lord, we know that there are incredible stresses being placed on parents and students and teachers. Help them. Father, we pray as well for Jesse in his medical situation. We pray that you will continue to hold your hand over him. We pray that you will be with Mark and Bonnie and with the medical professionals who are involved in his situation. We pray, O God, that you will be with Barb Endhoven, that you will comfort her and strengthen her during her time of grief. And Lord, we pray that you will be with the people at World Renew as they work to provide and and help out with maternal and child health throughout the world. Father, we pray as well for our farmers, both here and throughout the Northern Hemisphere, as it is getting to be harvest time. We thank you so much for the good weather that we have had recently for that. And we pray that you will protect our farmers, O God, that you will help them to stay safe on the fields, even if they are working long hours. Oh God. And Father, we pray that you would guide us as we dive into your scriptures. Would you help us to understand what you are saying to us and to live by your truth? Open our hearts and minds, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, brothers and sisters, we are on to part uh, 13 of our series on the nature and character of God. And I'm just trying to make sure that I have a connection to my laptop. But Aaron, you may have to advance the slide uh, just by doing the right arrows or the um, space bar um, for me. Okay? You don't have to do that just yet. I'll tell you. Okay? Good. (laughs) All right. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, we are talking today about God's persevering, pure, and encouraging nature. We are talking uh, about how God is uh, all of those things for us. And so we are looking, first of all, of course, at uh, this graphic, this infographic that uh, Karen Sorry has allowed us to use. Um, and again, we are so grateful for that. I, I thought about actually photocopying uh, the graphic and uh, giving it out, but I'm not allowed to hand stuff out right now. Um, so uh, you're just going to have to uh, look at it and sort of squint to see what we're looking at. But uh, as I mentioned, we are uh, moving in, we're zooming in on uh, God's persevering and pure and encouraging character. And our first passage that we're going to look at is a passage that is so familiar to uh, so many of us. And this is Psalm 23. Not only is it a tremendously beautiful and comforting psalm, but it is also one that is very widely uh, witnessed and seen in popular culture. Pretty much every time you have a funeral scene of some kind in a movie, there will be this passage being read by the priest or pastor or whatever. 
But that being said, even though it is so widely seen in popular culture, that does not in any way take away from its beauty and comfort for us. That being said, I don't know if I ever thought about how this passage, this psalm, shows God's persevering character. But let's look and see what God has to say. The scriptures say, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, your goodness and mercy, your goodness and love, excuse me, will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord. Amen. Just before we dive into how this demonstrates God's persevering character, uh, we need to note that there's, there's an interesting thing going on in this psalm that happens many, many, many times in Scripture, especially when you are looking at poetry, scriptural poetry, and or prophetic words that are, that are given. And that is that the perspective changes partway through the passage. In a way, right? In, in the first section, the Lord is my shepherd and so on, um, it, it is speaking of God sort of in the third person, right? He will and he does and he whatever. But then suddenly, um, when we get through, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. The psalmist shifts from speaking about God to speaking to God. And this can be a little bit disconcerting and also make it a little bit difficult to, to, for us to sort of track along with the psalmist or the, the writer of uh, prophecies, etc., this, this especially becomes difficult when there are, on occasions, times in prophetic words where you have the prophet speaking, and then, and then God is speaking, and there's not necessarily a real clear transition between when God is speaking and when the prophet is speaking. And that can be a little bit confusing. But it's always there. The hint of who is speaking is there. You just have to be careful with it. And, and so in this passage, it's, it's, almost like, it's almost like the psalmist is sort of convincing himself at first. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. And we can say that the psalmist is almost trying to convince himself because later on we see that, that the psalmist is at least in, in his mind facing the reality of enemies who are surrounding him or have in the past. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So the psalmist starts off reminding himself about who God is and what God is like. And as he remembers who God is, he shifts to speaking directly to God. And see, so saying, you know, I know all these things about you, God. And because I know all these things about you, I'm not going to be afraid. Because you are with me. 
you will comfort me. Even if I go, and other translations, older translations have, even if I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you, your, you are with me. The psalmist reminds himself of who God is. And as he reminds himself of who God is, he turns and addresses God himself and says, I, I know you. I know you are this God who comforts and preserves and guides me, who prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. And notice that the psalmist moves also from when he talks about even though I walk through the darkest of valley, it is sort of general, right? It, it, it can be a, a general things are really bad. But then he seems to get more specific. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. It's not just that in the vague bad times, God will look after the psalmist, but very specifically in, in whatever incident he's thinking of, God will is looking after him and caring for him. And this is where we get into the perseverance. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. This is not a God who lets go. This is not a God who stops paying attention. This is not a God who lets us down. God perseveres in the life of the psalmist. And by extension, in our lives, he doesn't just let us go. He follows with goodness and love all the days of the psalmist's life. Even if the psalmist does bad things, which elsewhere throughout the scriptures we read about, even then, God's goodness and love follows him all the days of his life. We can see this, of course, illustrated countless times throughout the scriptures with many, many biblical characters. We see God persevering with David, for example, even when he has done terrible things like what he did to Uriah the Hittite and to Bathsheba, his wife. We can see it, of course, in God's perseverance with the people of Israel, how time and time and time again over the course of thousands of years, the people of Israel would go away from God and God would pursue them. Over and over again, God persevered in their lives. And so our God is a persevering God. Next slide. Our God has a pure character. This is, <clears throat> this is near where we read uh, from our uh, confession and assurance. 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 to 3. We read some of this earlier. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friend, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. 
our God is pure. And this is tied in quite closely with the idea of God being perfect and holy as well. God is pure. There is no stain on God. God is, as we spoke about when we talked about his infinite nature, God is infinitely holy and perfect and pure. And we are called to purify ourselves to be like God in that. God is also encouraging. God is an encouraging God. This is a prayer of Moses, or sorry, excuse me, <laughs> that's not true at all. This is from Romans chapter 15. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even when Christ did not please for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. And that's a quote from Psalm 69, verse 9. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of my, this has become one of my favorite stories uh, in the scriptures, the story of Elijah um, when you remember the battle of uh, sort of the prophets of Baal, the, the, the altar battle on the mountain, right? Where, where, where Elijah challenges the prophets of the Baal to uh, call down fire from heaven from their Baal. Um, and he would do the same from Israel's God and they would see who wins, right? And, and the story, of course, you're familiar with it. It goes on and, uh, you know, Elijah successfully um, through God um, calls down fire from heaven and the prophets of Baal, even though they do all kinds of crazy things to try and make it happen, nothing happens for them, right? And after that, the prophets of Baal are, are killed by the people, but Queen Jezebel, she vows to have Elijah's head. And Elijah runs away. Like, I mean, he runs. Like, for days he runs. And he runs until he is absolutely exhausted. And he cries out to God, and, and obviously I'm paraphrasing, but he cries out to God saying, God, I am alone here. I need help. What am I going to do? There is only me and everybody else is following the Baal or doesn't care. And God, <clears throat> I love what God does. God first sends a ministering angel to Elijah who gives him some food and tells him to rest. And then Elijah rests. He sleeps. And he wakes. And the ministering angel comes back again and gives him some more food and some more rest. And then finally, finally, when Elijah wakes again, then God talks to him. Then God speaks with him and says, hey, look, I am going to provide a helper for you. Here he comes. And look, you're not alone. There are others. And look, you can hear my voice. I am with you. God takes the broken Elijah, who is absolutely at his wit's end, 
and he feeds him and comforts him and gives him rest and encourages him. Our God is an encouraging God. And he always has the scriptures also say a broken reed he, or a, a, a bruised reed, excuse me, he will not break. And a smoldering candle he will not snuff out. Our God knows our weakness. And he will encourage us. Well, what does it mean for us that God is pure and persevering and encouraging. Well, it means, of course, just like we've talked about with pretty much every sermon in this series, it means that we can rely on God. And perseverance really highlights that. We can rely on God to persevere with us, for us, no matter what the circumstances and, and I know there's the song out there uh, that speaks about God's reckless love, right? Uh, you know the song. Uh, I forget how it goes exactly right at the moment. But it speaks about God's reckless love. And, and it, is <clears throat> it is something that people take issue with a little bit because there is a sense in which God is not capable of being truly reckless. Uh, um, he, he cannot, it's not possible for God to do something carelessly, right? To do something totally um, foolish, truly foolish. However, what the song is trying to get at is the reality that God, I believe they're trying to get at the reality that God perseveres. He does not let go. He will not abandon you. No matter what. He pursues relationship with people to the end of their lives. He pursues loving relationship with humanity in spite of all we have done. He pursues us and will not let us go. And he will do pretty much anything except for force us to receive salvation. He will do pretty much anything to restore that relationship with us. This is, this is what Jesus shows us in a huge way. God would sacrifice his only begotten son. That's how much God will persevere in pursuing us. It may sound like I'm harping on this a little bit, but the reality is that there are many, many, many people in this world who think that God couldn't possibly love them because they are too sinful or they have done things that are too terrible or that God will have washed his hands of them and said, I'm writing you off. But that is not the witness of Scripture. That is not our God. There is, and I love this, there is nothing you can do that will make God love you any less. And there is nothing you can do that will make God love you any more. He just loves you. Aaron, you keeping up with the slides there, bud? Awesome. <laughs> He's my favorite son. He's my only son. 
All right. Um, we can rely on God's purity and on God's insistence that we be purified as well. This is a huge comfort to me, and I hope it is to you. The reality is, is that our God is pure and perfect and holy in all his ways, in his very core and his being. He is infinitely pure. But also, it is true that God is not content to leave you or I where we are. I get so, and I know I've shared this with you before, but I get so tired and so sad and broken hearted at my own brokenness, my own sinfulness. I cry out to God, how long, O oh God, will you let me continue to be like this? I don't want to be capable of sin anymore. Take it away. I'm tired of being broken. And God says to me, and God says to you, you will not always be broken. You will not always be sinful. You will not always fall to temptation. I am working in you. I am purifying you. My son has already saved you. You are already pure and spotless in my eyes, and I am still working in you. And someday, you will be free. You will be truly free, just as you are free because Christ has set you free, so you will truly be free in also no longer sinning. Your, your actual life will line up with your spiritual reality. You will come to a place because I will not let you, I will not tolerate you not being pure. You will become pure in every way. We don't, we're not going to stay this way. And even now, God is already at work in us. And lastly, we can learn to listen for God's encouragement because it is not always obvious, but we need to listen. We need to pay attention. There is so much in this world that can totally distract us from hearing God's encouraging voice. But we can learn to hear God's encouraging voice. How can we learn to hear God's encouraging voice? Through scriptures. Like Psalm 23. What an encouraging passage. But throughout the scriptures, there is so much encouragement for us. We can learn to receive and hear God's encouragement through prayer, through spending time with Him. And I'm not talking about sitting there and just giving God our, our grocery list of things we need. I'm talking about spending time with God, even if it means sitting there and not saying anything. Just listen. But it can mean all kinds of conversation with God. Prayer can teach us to hear God's encouraging voice. Practicing God's presence in our daily lives, reminding ourselves constantly, moment by moment, that we are not alone, but God is with us. Our good shepherd is with us. Practicing the discipline, for example, of breath prayers where we pray, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus, walk with me. 
and where we remind ourselves that there is not a moment where we are not alone. Where there is not a moment where we are alone. That's what I mean. There is not a moment where we are alone. We can practice listening and learning to discern God's encouragement by listening to the voices, the encouraging voices of brothers and sisters around us. And by sharing encouragement through our voices. Saying the good and encouraging thing. But what does it mean for how we are to live more Specifically, Because these are all parts of God's character, those things that we have been given in some measure and can grow in as well. Well, of course, it means that we can learn perseverance too. This is, after all, what Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 4 says. After all, we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And, the, and Romans goes on to say, and hope does not disappoint. We can learn to persevere. After all, it is key to our growth in maturity and in faith. It brings us character and hope. And we can learn to be pure as well. After all, in 1 John 3, verse 9, we've heard it a couple of times. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is what we are talking about. There will come a time where we will no longer sin. It, it, it is natural and inevitable. There will come a time, not in this lifetime, but there will come a time when we will no longer sin. And we can learn to encourage one another, just like I mentioned a moment or two ago. After all, Hebrews chapter 3, 12 to 13 says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. I think this is one of the things that, that sometimes we are good at, but sometimes we're not so good at. Sometimes we go out on a limb and we say the thing that we appreciate about the other person, about what they have done, about how they can walk in God's ways today, or we share with them what we have been learning in scriptures, or we share with them the story of how God is working in our lives. Sometimes we do that, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't think of the things that we are grateful for that God has given the other person. We just take them for granted. Or sometimes we don't, we don't want to bother or burden people with our stories. We think that those are somehow private and things that we shouldn't be talking about. Or, or we think, nah, the, the word that I had from God in, in, as I was looking at this person or thinking about this person, nah, that, that can't be right. God can't be prompting me to share something with this person. We deny sometimes those opportunities to encourage. But we can learn to be encouragers. Indeed, we must. We are called to encourage one another every day. Brothers and sisters, our God, our God is encouraging and persevering and pure. And we are called to that as well. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you so much that you are holy and perfect and pure. 
and that you, O oh God, insist that we need to be pure as well. Thank you, O oh God, further, that you do not leave us on our own to try and make ourselves pure without your help, but that instead, instead you have sent your Son to make us pure. And you send your Holy Spirit to make us pure so that we can be not only justified by Jesus Christ, but also sanctified through the work of your Spirit. Thank you, O oh God, that you do not break the bruised reed and you do not snuff out the smoldering wick but instead you send your encouragement. Help us to hear it and help us also to be an encouragement to others. And Father, thank you so, so very much that you persevere in your relationship with us, that you never let go thank you. Help us to persevere in our relationship with you, but also in our relationships with others, and in pursuing purity and holiness and righteousness and love most of all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.